Good afternoon. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Live Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell. I'm the founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine, and really happy that you took time on your uh, Thursday to join us. Uh, today's show is going to be a little bit different. Um, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, a lot different. Uh, so what we're the topic for today is the subjective science of mold sampling. Um, and interpretation. We just didn't want to put that in the title because it was just too many words and it just looked really cumbersome. Um, but to that end, it's a little bit of a role change here today. So I'm going to be more of the guest on the show today. Um, and uh, our typical moderator, uh, the uh, editor uh, and uh actually very heavily involved individual in the Healthy Indoors organization, Susan Valenti. Hi, Susan. Su Su Susan's taking the role of, uh, at this point, she's going to be taking the role of the moder well, the moderator and the host, I guess. I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the host mode. So one of the things I would like to invite our online studio audience to do, um, normally we don't, don't let you turn your cameras on until the second half of the show, but today you're welcome to turn your cameras on right away. Um, we're going to take your questions in real time rather than making you type them in the chat. Uh, although you're welcome to do that as well if you don't want to come on camera. Um, again, those of you in the live virtual studio audience, uh, use your reactions button down in the bottom uh, menu and click raise your hand if you want to, uh, you know, if somebody's not calling on you, that'll just make it easier for us. And um, we'll take your questions in real time. So, um, yeah, Susan, how, does, how, do you, how do you feel in this position? nervous you're, you're, I, I, are you I like really nervous behind, i like being behind the scenes wow okay all right well all right well i'm going to try to make it easy for you um i'll just keep talking and you won't have to do anything uh well well no 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 <laughs> i actually do have the you know i do have a great first question so oh. can i ask it um yeah I, I guess i'll have you ask the first question because um otherwise i'll just start off going down a path okay <laughs> So last week, the um, it actually came up on our show, um, you know, where we had uh, Dr. Lauren Desier um, of Life After Mold, and um, you know, and, and and it came up that um, that you and I and, and one of our friends, Tim A. Bear, were in Chicago in 1999, which like shows our age. Um, we were in Chicago and we did a um, a class on microscopy at the Macron Institute, which, um, which actually they still do, um, classes like that. Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm going to put a link in the chat and on our website, but, um, let's like start there, you know, because I think that's where our, um, you know, our subject, you know, our subjective science of mold sampling interpretation kind of got started. So why don't you like explain our little adventure we had in Chicago. So that's, that's actually, a, that's a, that's a great trip down memory lane. And I think it's a good starting point. So, um, so for those of you in the audience, so um, uh, Tim Bear is another, uh, another consultant, uh, similar size company to mine. We're, you know, both small business owners in the indoor environmental space. And uh, we met uh, being on the NADCA board of directors years ago. So we, we started with the national air duct cleaners. So, we both transitioned into dealing with microbial and mold activities back in the mid nineties. We were, we were doing it mostly in the HVAC side. So to that end, I'm just setting the, setting the stage for how I got into the, the mold, the mold work. It was more from HVAC hygiene work. Um, so we decided to go um, and actually take um, a microscopy class to actually be qualified to use a microscope, um, which makes a lot of sense. So Macron Institute is one of the premier places to, uh, to learn that. And um, they offer a 40 hour class, which, you know, again, certainly you're, you don't have a degree, you're not, you know, end all, whatever, but 40 hours of intense study with uh, some uh, qualified people is, you know, will get you down the right path. So, so Susan uh, joined us there. And um, so we, we took that week long class in Chicago. Uh, the, the instructor was Dr. John Shane. Uh, we learned a ton from him and uh, you know, he brought, he brought up a, made us understand a lot of how much subjectivity there is in direct microscopic analysis, which is what's used for spore traps and tape lifts and even some uh, 
uh, bulk sampling and uh, uh, swabs that are, you know, then plated out on a glass slide. So a lot of subjectivity there. Uh, interestingly enough, Susan, it's funny you mentioned that because that was almost where the idea for Healthy Indoors was born to. And that, that was it. Was it in 99 or uh, 2000? It was 99. It was 99. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cause I remember we had dinner talking about doing something and we wanted to do something online that had video. Uh, but of course in 99, the bandwidth issues, you couldn't live streaming was very difficult. I know we did our first live stream uh, back in like 2003 and it was really difficult <laughs> to say the least. So yeah. So th did I answer your question at, at all? Or I just meander. You meandered a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> So, so I guess to that end, so let, let, so let me run with that for a second. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I've been teaching, uh, you know, been involved with mold remediation and consulting for a long time since, you know, since the early nineties and uh, you know, before the term mold remediation was even being used widely in the industry. Um, and, you know, I made a lot of just horrible mistakes early on because there wasn't a lot of guidance on how to do this, right? I mean, I was taking, you know, doing mold sampling in the field back before people commonly use spore trap technology, right? Because before we had things like the aerosol and the other type of cassette type uh, spore traps. So where we had to actually take a slide and grease it with lithium grease and uh, use either a single stage Burkhart uh, uh impactor or allergenco you know there, there were some crazy devices back then they were pretty cool but spore trapping w was really kind of uh not commonly done and most of the guidance documents and most of the cognizant authorities back then relied heavily on single stage or multi-stage anderson type samplers so culture samples the petri dish in the impactor right um which you know it, the, the world's changed a little right um, so I, I guess you know, one of the things I would pose out to the audience is those of you, you know, in this audience, you know, and chime in in the chat, please. Um, how many of you are directly involved with doing uh, consulting work where you're doing mold sampling? And if so, you know, what's your, what are your primary sample uh, sampling methodologies that you use? Do you use spore traps? Do you use culture plates? Um, do you use uh, swabs, you know, tape lifts uh, or something else? Um, so one of the things that became blatantly apparent to me, though, early on in the industry, is that each one of these um, each one of these sampling methodologies only looked at part of it, right? You know, and Susan, we got that. You know, we we discussed that when we were out in the class, right? Look, just yeah. doing the direct microscopy. So you know, so we'll, we'll get into direct microscopy in a second, but I just want to talk set the stage for the overview here. Um, every one of these methodologies is very target specific. You know, spore traps you know, look at, basically look at everything, all the particles flying in the air and give you the opportunity to look at them under direct microscope review. But there's a lot of organisms, mold organisms, right, spores that look the same when they're broken up and not in their full structure, their full fruiting body structure. So under a microscope in an air sample, a penicillium spore and an aspergillus spore and a lot of other ones that are round and, uh, you know, the spherical two micron or whatever, one to three micron size particles, they tend to look the same if you don't see them in the whole structure. So that's what happens like with spore traps, uh, you know, your reviews on your reports will say penicillium aspergillus like or aspergillus penicillium like or merospores, there's all these other terms uh, that different laboratories use, uh, but they lump them all together. So that to me is a big problem that we can talk about a little later. Now, the converse of that, you know, using the culture, the single stage impactors like the Anderson N6, um, you're you're putting an uh, an auger plate or agar or however you pronounce it i say auger um and you're putting that in there so but it's it there's a media in that auger plate's made up of a media that's target specific there's all different types of mediums that you can put in the petri dish and certain things will grow certain organisms more readily than other organisms so here's the problem there's not one single auger plate that catches every type of mold in the air equally and lets it grow on that plate and the other the other problem is the only thing that you find in that that type of a sample is spores that germinate and become viable colonies. OK, so it's only viable. You know, it's colony forming units is how it's reported, uh, where spore traps reported in uh, spores per cubic meter. But they don't you can look at fragments in a spore trap, too. So I, I, I went on and on here, but. Um, but, when you're ready for your next question, bring it up. Well, well, OK, you know, I am ready for my next question. 
so like where did you know like where did where do people learn how to do all this sampling mold sampling or or any kind of like air sampling you know i mean like you know is it just like is it just information you can like google or is there like specific um is there specific standards out there that like teach you is there like specific manufacturers that like you know kind of like say hey you're you know you're gonna be a sampler and you know this is how you do it yes <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of different places that people get the information you know i mean uh, aiha has a field sampling guide um there's a lot of cognizant authorities like acgih that have documents out there like the bioaerosols handbook and there's a lot of documents coming from that side from the industrial hygiene side that talk, discuss specifically how to do these things um and some of that stuff needs some updating by the way but that's another story. Uh, manufacturers of the products tend to have some guidance material. A lot of the laboratories, quite frankly, a lot of the larger lab uh, uh, entities out there that you know that you might send your uh, samples to be analyzed at actually have guidance documents. You know, you best practices on how to do sampling. So there's a lot of good information out there. But what? I, but I think. Moreover, is the big picture of what sample should you be taking? Why why are you sampling? What do you what are you trying to find? What are you looking for? You know, and there, there's just a whole bunch See, those of questions. Those are my next questions. Yeah, the, know, the, the, that's like, the problem. There's a whole bunch of but okay. So, and I'll let you ask the question, but I just want to preface it by saying, if you if you don't ask this question first, like what am I trying to find and why am I doing the sampling, you can't even decide what methodologies to use, can you? I wouldn't think so. Yeah, I mean that's kind of a problem, right? You know, so so you know, herein lies your dilemma is that us in the consulting community, you know, tend to re reinvent the wheel a lot in this industry because there there's no agreed upon clearance samples or clearance uh, specs, right? You know, like in other in, in other uh, indoor environmental fields like radon, asbestos, lead, I mean, there, there's there's pass and fail numbers. They're very black and white. You have a you have a target number to shoot for, and you know, right or wrong, it's at least it, it's a you know it's a pass or fail. It's pretty clear. But it, with mold, like we make it up. You know, we we do comparisons to the outdoor. We do comparisons sometimes to unaffected areas. Um, what's good? What's bad? I mean, you know, it's pretty much judgment calls all the time. So, okay. So that's, Okay, so I'm going to stop you right there, and Terry Sofer is going to ask his question because it it, it definitely goes along with this. Perfect. Hi, Terry. And hey. Before you ask your question, everybody else that's in the audience, please turn your cameras on. You know, don't don't be bashful. This is going to be an open discussion. I don't want it to just be Bob and Susan speaking the whole time. By the way, uh, as a pre prelude to my question, uh, I just want to note that your full title for this session would have made a great acronym simsi sssmsi you should okay. have used it bob uh yeah um, okay so i'm going to be uh, uh, a bit provocative with my question perfect um why do any mold sampling at all now let me briefly explain i'm, I'm overstating it a bit but let me briefly explain those of us like you and susan that have read uh, a lot of the research on mold and indoor air quality know that there are now, it, it's well known that there are lots of species of mold that produce mycotoxins. And it's typical of those species to produce multiple mycotoxins. So, <clears throat> and it's also pretty well known that there's a strong association if not absolute scientific proof that mycotoxins can, can cause all kinds of toxic adverse health effects in humans, not just allergenic effects. So if we know that, why do we even need to sample to find out what kind of mold um, species are present and whether they're viable or not? Because what research has also told us is that uh, non-viable spores and fragments of mycelia and fragments of spores and so forth can all contain very high concentrations of mycotoxin molecules. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, why is there any value to sampling? If we find mold or indications of mold, 
then why does it matter what species it is or whether it's viable? Why not just go into full remediation at that point and not spend the money on sampling? You, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I, and I, and I think it's a valid point. Um, and I think sometimes it doesn't make any sense to, to actually take samples. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think sampling always is, is a great strategy, especially if you visually come in and see a situation where there's, you know, visible, you know, the fungal activity has gotten so big. There's so much mold growth that surfaces are covered. It's visible to the naked eye. I mean, at that point, I, no, I, I don't see any reason to be sampling either, to be honest, Terry. I would never, uh, you know, a, ask a client to do that. It wouldn't make sense to me. Uh, I think where sampling comes into play is when you can't, you can't readily identify a situation in the space. Like people are, you know, there, there's, concerns that you know we think we might have a problem but we can't visually see anything so you know that's where that becomes a piece of a di you know one of the diagnostic tools in your bat utility belt to go out and actually um you know get pieces of information but sam here's you know here's the big question right there you know why sample because the sampling and i, I mentioned this last last week with uh dr tess here um it, we're sampling in the IAQ community, we sample, do environmental sampling protocols. So we're, you know, either spore traps or, you know, we could look for chemicals, like we can look for mycotoxins, we can look for, you know, gas, off-gassing like the MVOCs and things like that. But what do those actually directly mean as far as a, you know, uh, exposure cause relationship to the individuals? We don't know that. So we're, we're not, we're not doing health-based sampling, right? So that's a problem because I've got, I've asked this question since the beginning. Quite frankly, I've been pissing people off for thirty years about this. I guess I'm like, you, you know, this many spores per cubic meter. So I go, what the hell does that mean, though? Does that mean that Mrs. Smith's going to get sick or not? That's Is exactly that the right thing to even look at? You know, and, and mycotoxins are only part of the picture, Terry. I know mycotoxins are a serious part of the picture, but it, like like our guest last week mentioned, you know, you've got you've got allergic reaction, you know, the, you know the IEG responses, which can be very severe in people and, and and there's you know there's different ways that you could be affected by mold in the environment and certainly from the medical community and this is where testing really makes sense and for viables is dealing with things like aspergillus fumigatus or aspergillus niger which are potential pathogens and cause infections and so you know in the surgical theater right if a, somebody's performing surgery and those spores get in the open wound they can cause a deadly infection so in, you know, so in certain limited cases, I think viable sampling makes a lot of sense too in those environments, especially. But you know, but I don't think it needs to happen all the time. No. I... The other the other thing that research uh, tells us is that in the typical damp building, the indoor air that the building, the damp materials in the indoor air is contaminated with multiple microbiologicals, and so it's logical to assume that there may well be bacterial endotoxins. And as you pointed out, uh, mold also, uh, uh, mold factors that can cause health issues include glucans, mm -hmm. beta glucans, and they're found in every cell of mm -hmm. a mold organism. Yeah, and you know, and you raise a great, a great counter, uh, counter uh, issue there too, is, is that, the industry has tended to, you know, and we did it in our title too, intentionally calling it, you know, mold sampling. But the reality is, right, um, if you're in an environment that's that has the right moisture conditions to support mold growth in a space, there's a good likelihood that you also could have bacterial contamination in the space. And, you know, you can take all the spore traps and all, even the, even the culturable samples for mold you want, you don't identify bacteria with those. <laughs> so you have to, you know, typically, and bacteria is hard to catch in the air. Air, air aerosol sampling for bacteria is almost you know i'm not saying impossible but really difficult in the field you have to use a bubble impactor and it's like this is not feasible really so you got to do surface sampling for that the point being is that there's a lot of other constituents there microbiological constituents that are not just mold and i think people are more attuned to that now with the pandemic right because now we're worried about viral issues too um so all right hey bob yeah Scott Amore is on the, is on this call and um, he's making a bunch of like comments in the chat and um, you know, and there he, he actually just said, and he actually just said, no, dot, 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 dot. So I'm like, I have to know what I he wanna, just yeah, said what, no to. Scott, hi bud. <laughs> he's probably referring to my comments. 
Okay, I'm trying to, first of all, I just want to be clear. I'm trying to get my hair to do the Bob Corral thing. So <laughs> it's, you know, this, why honestly, I didn't, I didn't use product today. This is like, this is like, take a shower and don't do anything. That's what this looks like. I didn't like, even yeah. style it today. That, yeah. I just want to say this it is really cool. Um, that those are that that's debris, uh, uh, electron microscope image of debris from a kitchen, a used kitchen sponge. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sponges. <laughs> no, we don't have those in my kitchen. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, um, I, I apologize. I missed the first uh, 10 or 12 minutes of this. And he didn't miss that I, much. I caught Terry uh, discussing some some really important comment making some really important comments you know my first thought was what's uh what's an important concentration what is he considered high concentration of mycotoxins right and then you joined in the conversation keeps rolling and as i thought of maybe a dozen questions including a couple to for mr hartshorn um <laughs> wait, i don't even need we'll to get to those questions after you explain the no you're right here. I, I actually started to write. Look, I started to write. The big problem at the root of this discussion is an entire industry. And by that, I mean something that some of us have watched since. Holy about shit. About <laughs> You're actually wow. going there? Yes. Whoa. Okay. You took, you took that away from me. I was going there, but okay. Go we, on. I, I know. It, I'm stealing your thunder. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we have a, we have a, the professional environmental characterization industry, the professional exposure assessment industry, a long time ago was usurped by the common man. And that was because labs and pump salesmen were able to convince anyone they can go out and collect the sample. And indeed, you know, they can stand by machine and put it in an envelope and get a result from a lab and labs began to produce industrial hygiene type responses and reports. And so HVAC guys and home inspectors and, and just name it, right? The list goes on forever. They can all take a sample. And then they put on their truck and they embroider on their shirt, indoor air quality expert and mold expert, uh, indoor health assessment, whatever it is. And we've allowed that to happen. And these people don't have, I mean, that's 90% of our industry are those people. The solution to indoor pollution. Well, yeah, just get a hose and dilute it, right? Just wash it off. But the that is a problem and that's because they spread the word right they for every 10 people i get to talk to or bob or terry there's a thousand other people that don't have that kind of background don't have that kind of educated skill and they're selling samples so every day i get calls from people but why are you confusing me everyone i talked to said i need to take an air sample an ermy sample an endotoxin friction sample i i don't know so it's a new it's a new kind of organism the endotox endofricotoxin yeah okay endofrixin the endofrixin and the endofrixin organism okay the, uh, you know we've got a firm out there right now flying people around the country sending two assessors from two different cities to another city and they are charging six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars and they're taking 40 and 50 samples and I have followed them across the country and I've gone to some of their projects and I've reassessed for for one tenth of what they've done and I've changed their protocols and I've saved people 50, 75, 85% of what the remediation would have cost because of errors and incorrect assumptions. And we can't correct that, right? How do you stop someone from being the best car salesman in the world, right? I mean, it's here, here you need these car mats. Well, my car comes with car mats. No, you got to have the other car and you need wax, but my car yeah, is I mean, brand new. It's wax. No, that's, you, see, that's the, that's the problem though. You know, honestly, Scott, you're hitting on a, on a good point here because there's also this emo psychosocial emotional factor going on. People are, you know, uh, Lauren, uh, Dr. Lauren, you know, uh, last week, said that, yeah, you know, she, I mean, she, she raised that issue that, you know, it's, there's a real stress response with people, obviously. I mean, you, you know, I've, we've all seen this as consultants in the field where people, when it's their home, like they're upset at work, you know, situation with work is one thing, but when it's your home and your children and stuff, there, there's such an emotional attachment to that, that that's, you know, 
I don't know. It's it's people well, people desperate. are easily swayed by persuasive salesmen in those situations. They're desperate, aren't they? Yeah, they're totally desperate. Because they've been sick for not just a few days or a week or two, like a cold or a flu or some allergy, right? The other, you know, a few months ago I had allergies and it annoyed the hell out of me for seven days, right? I I wasn't desperate. I know it was gonna go away, right? And well, I had COVID and for two weeks it annoyed the hell out of me. But I mean, so seriously. Right. Um I mean, years. There's people other things that are not in- indoor environmental that, that that are factors for people. Right. I mean, Terry knows this, you know, as good as any, but maybe better than anybody on the, on this group right now. You know I mean? These people are, are unfortunately, they're sick and suffering for ages. I, I, am, I meet people every day. Every day I talk to a new person. So, so to that point, though, the question is, is so is it? Is sampling totally just invalid? You shouldn't do sampling. There's no no validity to it. I mean, like, okay, I, well, I suspect we, that you do some sampling sometimes. Yeah, we absolutely. But it has to be known as an adjunct. It has to. Look, I've I've used I coined a t- phrase a long, long time ago. All sampling results must increase the power of your decision making. And I can show you how to make a decision prior to sampling and you do a binary. It's a black or white, yes or no, good or bad, positive, negative. So you predict what your sampling is gonna do for you. And then you say, is that going to change my decision? So if I wanna know what's in the dirt in the house, do I need to sample it? Well, no, because your decision was get rid of the dirt anyway. Right, so there was no reason to sample it. Like, do you need to test that gypsum board if you're gonna tear that gypsum board out? Well, hell no, it doesn't make any sense. Wait, 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 but wait a second, okay? (laughs) If you're, you know, and then I'm gonna pass this off to Pat because he's chomping at the bit to like talk to you. Okay, I'll Um, mute myself. Okay, so, so here's my question, okay? You know, you know, if this sampling is done, you know, to help to help decision making, who's making the decisions? Is it you as like the the car salesman or is it the consumer who doesn't know what the hell, you know, is is, is you know, is the right sample to do anyway? So that reminds me of that commercial. It was a commercial from Toyota years ago when they had the certified used Toyota cars. And, uh, you know, guys meeting a girl at some bar and, and, and he, what do you do? And he goes, oh, you know, I sell used cars. She goes, ooh, and he goes, for Toyota. And she goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what? I wish I would have joined last week because I'm very familiar with the early stages of the ICI. Okay. From, right. And I have a huge a bone to pick. And I would have loved to open it up because one of the problems is the doctors and we can't get through the doctors. The doctors have pre-established what they want to do. And so I will guarantee you 75% of my patient clients were told by some sort of practitioner. And I'm going to use that as an umbrella term. It's a good umbrella term. Because that's what the word they use. You know, when you don't want to use a doctor, you have to go to a practitioner. And which by the way, about 20% of them are dietitians and nutritionists, but they call themselves a, 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 a functional medicine practitioner, but they're really trained as a nutritionist. Anyways, I, I, I digress. You digress. The problem is we can't get to the doctors to teach them what reliability and validity mean. We can't get to them to show them why an ERMI is not valid for answering the question, is there a mold exposure? It's not valid. You use the word valid, right? I think Susan or somebody. Why is it not valid for determining damage in a house? Why are air samples not valid for whatever, right? We can't break through that barrier because that particular organization, as well as several others, have put up huge barriers and roadblocks. And they don't know that the people they're listening to are not presenting accurate information. Okay, that's it. And I mean, Susan, still, your answer. That's your opinion. You know, maybe, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. okay. I'm Pat. Uh, Let's go to you. <laughs> there he's, here we go. I go away. Okay, Scott muted. Good. Um, so I, I guess my point is we I do sample a lot. And the reason I sample a lot is because I'm not sampling for necessarily for the health of the occupants in the building. I'm sampling to establish what we call baselines for remediation projects. We want to know is this remediation simply removing the mold on the wall in room A, or has the mold on the wall in room A jumped into that air return and potentially contaminated room B, C, D, and E? So maybe we need to clean those rooms too after, you know, while we're doing this. 
we're just establishing a um, the condition of the air based on spore counts. I never turn that into, oh, by the way, homeowner, your health might be affected by this spore count level or something like that. That's not what we're doing it for. So to me, that's a valid, um, and there's a lot more to that. I just, we don't have the time. That's a valid um, process because I'm then coming back in after the project and I'm doing the exact same sampling again. And in a lot of cases, we might have a set of what we would consider to be um, acceptable samples up front. You know, everything looks fairly normal, normal fungal ecology or uh, however you want to call it. And then in the end, we come in and we got 10,000 stacky per cubic or, or cubic meter. Well, the mold on the surface that I swabbed was all stacky botry. So, yes, so somebody knocked some of it loose somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So the probability uh, yeah. is that the remediation contractor caused that problem. And in 17 years, by doing that with the local remediation contractors, they have paid for that cleanup every time that has happened. The homeowner or building owner has not been responsible for that because we have fairly valid proof that it likely came from the remediation contractor's failure. So that's that's where we use sampling the most, mm -hmm. but we all get that call. I don't feel good in my house. I want it sampled, or I don't feel good at work. I want it sampled. Those come with, and Scott and I, every time Scott and I get on the phone, it's like four hours, but um, those come with a long lengthy process before sampling should ever be done. And sure. It's right. The sampling, part. right. Sampling shouldn't be the first part of your protocol. If it is, you're a pump jockey and you don't yeah. actually probably know what you're doing. And I agree with Scott, 90 something percent, Bob or Scott said this, 90 something percent of the guys out there, and we have, we're plagued with it locally over the last five years or so. The home inspectors all became air sample guides. And I am just overwhelmed with people sending me reports that the home inspector gave them because they don't do data review. They don't know how to do data review. They don't even know what the heck the report means. They just give them to the homeowners. And I don't do anything with them. Um, sometimes I send them to guys like Scott or Mike Bittner or somebody like that just for fun so they can see what's going on. But um, I don't do anything with those. I just tell them I have to come in and do my own. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I, I strongly caution anybody using somebody else's information or how did they get there? What did they do? What was their hypothesis? You know, what yeah. was their sampling plan? Why did yeah. they make that sampling plan? Well, that's Can't back to the whole, that, that's back to the whole su subject subjectivity of it, though. I mean, the reality is, uh, do they come in? Are you doing quiescent samples? You're not stirring anything up. Are you coming in and stomping around right there? You, you can change the whole profile about what you see just by how your activity as the sampler. And, and I always like joke about that. It's like, well, c you know, we can test to see if it, you know, if it, if it passes. It's like, do you want it to pass or not? Because I could actually make a test that fails it or passes just by how I take my sample. You know, it's like, I mean, seriously, you trying to pass you trying to pass what it was like before something happened after something happened. But, but I, I, I do like for me, I'm gonna throw my input in here. I, mm -hmm. I do agree with, with taking some baseline stuff on a remediation project to have some data, something numerical because clients want to see something numerical, you know, that that's the problem. And, you know, in, in our litigious society, you have to have something, but, you know, but then the counterpoint to that is right. That none of us take enough samples to be statistically significant. So if you're on the other side of that as the expert witness, you can shoot the thing to pieces anyway, because if somebody takes three spore traps and starts categorizing the house, what the hell do they know? Nothing. They know five right. minutes and a couple cubic feet of air. That's what they know. Now, Bob and Pat both gave, you both gave great description, <laughs> right? The, but the the real problem is, you, you, I mean, look, scroll down the list of people attending this. <laughs> we need we need we need ten times we need a hundred times more attending this. We need a thousand more because I want more viewers on healthy indoors. I agree, and they need to hear us and understand and believe us, right? The problem is what Pat just started describing. I described 90%, right? So we have 10 people here. That means there's 90 other people today taking air samples, both pre-remediation, post-remediation, health assessment, whatever reason they're taking samples and they're describing it incorrectly. So I would trust Bob to come and do some pre-remediation samples. I would definitely trust Pat. I, I, Why well, have I, definitely and just, just me, you know, not definitely. No, I, I'm just, I'm giving Pat some props. Just, I'm just messing with you. I'm messing with he you. He always thinks I disagree with him. But he's, because he lays out the foundation and the framework for why his sample can be valid, right? He, he's one of the few people who can take that and describe exactly what he's doing and what he expects 
and what the result actually means, as opposed to the guy who says, yeah, there was a whole bunch of black stachybotrys still, still on the wall after the radiation, but I took an air sample anyways, right? <laughs> you know, like, hello, right? right? Pass visually. <laughs> you need to pass visually before you do it. Yeah, if it's not clean, if it's not visibly clean, you freaking did a shitty job. I'm sorry. It's like done. You know, a long time ago, I started keeping track and and I said, we were working on one of the early versions of the 520. And I said, you know, I have never granted a clearance the first time out for the visual. So in other words, 100% of every single clearance I ever did failed for the visual, 100% starting in like whatever, the first hemosiderosis investigation I did, right? I was like, wow, this place is pretty dirty. You guys didn't do a good job. And it, and it continued. And sometimes it would be a little pile in the corner. Sometimes it would be a whole wall full of mold. Mm-hmm. Who knows what it was? I am still at that batting, right? I'm batting a thousand. I fail every single job I'm on. You must be uh, very I'm popular in Ohio. It's not my fault. It, <laughs> it, 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 I... <laughs> Oh, I don't do the remediation. I just find I, the crap. They do not. See, I get it. And you, Scott, you, you, so you know, with my history prior to New York State, uh, you know, regulating mold, and you could you couldn't wear, you know, be on both sides. I, we were a design build company, so we went out and did did spec work, and we did cleanups, you know, and we did them really well for a lot of years. But I, that gave me twenty plus years of you know of experience being on both sides of the fence, and I understand how hard it is to be a contractor too. And I think sometimes some consultants don't understand what can actually be achieved either. You know, I mean, some consultants. I'm not saying you, but I'm saying in general, some right. You know, so yeah, it should be vis- It should be clean. If you're doing a remediation, there should be no visible dust or anything anywhere. That's just that's like if you can't get that through your head as a contractor, you shouldn't be in the industry. Bob, can I, I, I come um, in? Sure. I gave, yeah. someone a, a, a clue. I gave someone a clue the other day, you know, all the time I go, look, I'm not nitpicky. If I can find the problem from a standing up position without a light, it's pretty significant something left behind, right? It's not, I'm not going for the quarter inch by quarter inch. I'm going something I can see from eight feet away. Okay. That's a problem. Okay. Now, um, next is Maurice and then Pat. Bob, to, to, to try and say, and you've been a remediator and you know this probably better than any, anybody who's on the screen today, but to try to say you're going to clear a project because it's visually clean is super suggest- su- suggestive because we should never use the naked, the naked eye to determine, especially in a clearance, whether there is or isn't. I mean, I've looked at projects that I mean, they look super clean. But once we took an air sample, we could tell the remediator didn't use a HEPA vacuum because we had thousands of ASPEN. We had thousands of stachybotrys uh, that was also identified. We had mucor identified uh, in extremely high numbers. And if you were to look at it, you would have said you could have eaten off of the surfaces. Well, and- I would say you can't, you can't clear visually. You can fail visually. Right. That, that's the first step of clearance. It's like it has to pass gotcha. visual, and then to me, you go to the next step. Right. Gotcha. Right. And then back to back to sampling. You as a remediator probably know also, unless you have a scope of work or protocol, we do a lot of wall cavity samples because we want to know where that mold has amplified, where the where the mold amplified, and also where the water migrated. And the only way you're going to tell it is to get into those wall cavities. Now, if you're trying to do health related issues there's no sampling pump on the market that is capable of capturing more than two cubic feet of air at any given time so if you move that pump east or west north or south up or down uh, you, you've got a capability or probability of getting a complete different set of results and to take air samples alone i don't think is good uh, mm-hmm. but wall cap cavities alone don't give you exposure they give you a contaminated surface, but they don't give you exposure. And uh, but but wall cavities, I think, are necessary. And I think air is necessary, especially if somebody has a health-related issue. It's necessary for them to take that report to their healthcare provider. To their How doctor. about surface sampling, though? Because we're t- dealing with micro- microscopic size things. You visually, th- there can be actual amplification on like say a drywall surface that you can't see with your flashlight and eyes exactly. you, you put it under 600 power suddenly you see it on the bright field microscope 100 all right pat 
Yeah, on the Bob saying on surface sampling, I mean, the only reason I ever surf, a lot of time people want you surface sample just because they want that, that yes or no. It, it, does that mold sit in that surface or is it soot and dryer lint? Which I got a long story on that one. Um, it's, it, it's not something I use to determine anything to do with the air quality, the health of the occupants or something like that. We're just using it to prove mold or not. And insurance companies, all of them, it seems like they want to see that data. They're always asking for that kind of stuff if they're involved in these things. Um, on the sampling part, I spoke with the guy who invented the aerosol. Um, Baxter. Thank you. Uh, Dan Baxter. Years, right? yeah. yeah, quite a few years ago. And he gave me the impression that it's a 15 foot zone on a five or maybe that was 10 minute sample. I don't remember. But that you're you're collecting 15 feet. Does anybody know anything about that? You're getting you're getting two and a half, approximately two and a half uh, cubic feet of air in a, in a 15 liters per minute for five minutes, which is kind of like, that's the standard, you know, so that's usually what you're getting. And their collection efficiency, any distance away from that, from that sieve on that, on that cassette, it's not very good. It, you know, as far as you, you're not getting a homogeneous sample for an entire room off of, off of a spore trap. No okay, way. So, so we have about 80% forced air heating systems in Alaska. Um, we sample with the forced air fans on. We sent, because 70, 72 to 75% of the time in Alaska, your furnace is heating your house. So we sample under normal living conditions. If there's kids walking around, that's the normal house. If there's, you know, whatever, we sample mm -hmm. under normal living conditions. That's the process we've been doing for 18 years. We do it every time. We also sample if we're doing something that's like a whole house kind of thing or something like that, or, you know, the minimum samples. Remember, the driver is the money. They're not going to pay for more samples. That's the unfortunate part of this industry. But air returns sample put your sample in front of the air return somewhere somewhere where the house is bringing the air to and you sample in that location but you got to make sure that when you come back to do your secondary sampling like after remediation that exact scenario is recreated or else your 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 data is yeah i mean one, one of the things i always i always like to go back to this this parable because it's I, i've done it in classes for 25 years now but the six blind men from Indistan. Susan's going to go, oh my God, he's saying this again. But so, you know, this, this fa according to this fable, right, this elephant wanders into a village of six blind elders and they're tasked with going to the center, of the center of the square and deciding what the elephant looks like. So they're all touching the elephant. You know, one grabs around the legs, says, oh, the elephant's like a tree. Another grabs a tail, the elephant's like a rope. Another grabs a trunk, it's like a boa constrictor. Here's the problem. Every one of them in their very limited perspective is probably correct with their assessment. But the overall assessment's wrong because they have it's a very limited view of the total data. So I always say this when I'm teaching as far as sampling and, you know, and doing consulting work is that I do like to see air sampling. I do like surface sampling. I like laser particle counts. I like, you know, you know, thermal, thermal uh, imaging, looking for condensation points, moisture meters. I mean, all of it. And, and even then you're shooting from the hip because you still have just a limited piece of data that you're working with there. You know, you, you, so the biggest, you know, your best sensory device should be on your shoulders to, to you yeah. know, to try to put the stuff together. I use particulate counters. I started years ago keeping track to help me determine times for sampling. So, so you don't over, overload a cassette. Yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while you overload a cassette. You're like, what the heck? Well, if you had a particulate counter, you would have seen that up front that it's a dusty, dirty environment. So you can reduce yeah. your minutes. They're, they're laser I, we've been using them since 95 laser counters. I mean, they're. they're to I'm me, not. that's that's just a standard tool. It should be in your belt for that. Right. Um, and what was your thing to say? Oh, so the other advocate thing I'm for, and Scott knows this, and I think I talked to you a little bit about Bob, is the 100% laboratory analysis. Oh, sure. Again, on spore traps, you're talking about the reading, trap. reading the trace. Yeah. I don't know of a labs out there. I've never heard of a lab under a general contract. None of my competitors in this state, anyhow, do 100% analysis. It's all like that 25% times four analysis. So... For us, we've been able, so lawyers love that. They love that 100% thing. And it seems to, to win over because lawyers sort of like sampling too. They like to see that data. They let them do whatever they want with it. But the other part of that is data review. You know, you got in compared to out. You got background debris ratings. You got percentages of difference on the inside samples. You got types of, of mold families that are present, ubiquitous or not. You got uh, hypofragment counts, you got bacteria, uh, the mold scores in our reports. I mean, there's like nine different things you look for on, on data review. I don't know of anybody else around here that does anything other than inside to out, period. They're done. And they're just doing spore trap? Because that, see, that's to me, that's yeah. insane. Because how do they, how do they, how does anybody that just does spore trap 
you know, and, and trying to make a, a decision on that, deal with ASP pen or pen ASP when that's inside and outside. How do you know that it's not penicillin crossogenum outside, aspergillus right. versicolor inside? You're dead in a, in a, in a deposition with that because you can't, defa- you cannot argue that point unless you've done cultures or PCR or something to back it up. Right. So, you know, and, 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 and to your point, you know, with the, as far as, you know, like the collection efficiency and, and you know, doing full traces, think about it. You, you've got the sample cassette, you know, you collect two and a half, cubic feet of air approximately right that gets analyzed but that's not you that's not a homogeneous air to, to an environment there's stratification there's temperatures there's wind turbulence there's the size of the particles because small particles don't settle the big particles fall out stachybotrys doesn't fly very well you know i mean you can go on and on with all these different points they go to a lab and they only read 25 percent of it and that's subjective because somebody's reading it with their eye one two you know it's like you know you got you got the microscopist down here you know, looking at that yeah. stuff and, you know, and they come up with numbers and then it comes back to you and you spores per cubic meter. And what the hell does that mean? What does that even mean? You know, so my, my concern here is you're right. If they're only reading 25% of the surface, you're adding another tier of variabil- variability. That's just crazy. Right, they're not Bob, I'm anyway. I'm going to jump in Patsy. You're next. And then Scott. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. See this lab here. A-E-M-L. Yep, we know them. Reads 100% of the slide. Okay, so there's I one. talked to A-E-M-L a couple months ago. They read. They told me they read 100% for stachybotrys only. You have to have a special contract with them in order to do any higher than that. That's what they told me. Oh, well, that's not what they're doing with my reports. They're reading 100% of the slide. So, that's good just to give you an idea that there is one out there that's doing it. Well, there, there's um, a bunch, a lot of this, uh, there's smaller labs too that do, you know, some of the boutique labs do that as well. Right. And so just to give a summary of this whole conversation. <clears throat> um, so I did remediate, I was on the remediation side of it starting in the early nineties for 10 years. And then I branched off into my own consulting for the last 16, 17 years. Right. So I, I have the ability to, to look at things from a contractor side and a consulting side, right? So um, you guys are talking about air samples and all these things and flaws with all of them. Yeah, they're all flawed. But you know, when I go out to do an assessment and I call it an assessment, um, you know, first off, I spend a good amount of time on the telephone with the person. I ask them all the things about them, about their house, how long they've lived there, what's going on, what's the history blah, 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 blah. Uh, so then there, then you have a baseline of, okay, what's going on? What is your problem? What are you trying to solve, right? So, you know, most of the time it's the mold issue. Um, and then it's an investigation. It's basically an investigation. So there has to be an appropriate sampling strategy, right? Whether that's air, surface, whatever, you know, it has to be appropriate. You know, and you could go into what's appropriate and what isn't. But I, my, every single assessment I do is very, um, it's the same, right? So I get called into depositions a lot and all my reports and everything I do and all my methods and techniques are pretty similar. So I'm not, you know, playing favorites with different um, projects and stuff, right? So it's an investigation. It's a lot of interviewing and talking to the people, what's going on, what's happened, uh, appropriate air sampling, where and when. Where, why are you taking these, right? Like the customer needs to know there's an answer for that, you know? And if they got somebody coming out there that's just taking air samples and they can't answer why and where they're, and where they're taking them and why they're taking them in those areas, red flag, right? There's a reason. It's a piece of the investigation. It's not the whole thing. It's just a, it's a piece, the air samples, the visual okay. inspection, that's another piece of it. The history is another piece of it. The, you know, if they're getting moldy smells, you know, you can't, you can measure MVOCs, but it's not real practical. MVOCs cause health issues, right? That's the smell you're getting. So, you know, there's all these things that go into it and then boom, here's my report. It goes to reputable remediation contractors, right? I tell if they're my client, I'm like, here's a list of certified reputable remediation contractors in this St. Louis area that I can vouch for because I've done thousands of jobs with them before and after they get the report, they follow the plan. I go back, I do the clearance, which is again, a whole bunch of stuff at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Did they follow the plan? Is, is it clean? Is there no visible mold? Does the air sample meet the normal fungal ecology criteria? 
blah, blah, blah. And I have a, I have a very good partnership. I'm independent of all these contractors, but I have a very good partnership with a lot of reputable credentialed certified remediation contractors in this area. So it's a team effort, right? We're mm -hmm. working together on this as a team effort. It's not me, you know, the mold police coming in telling everybody with a whip what to do. Right. But Patsy, do you think that's typical of the industry, though? I mean, because like what no, you're describing I mean is not. like really it's like it's it's. A, I'm going to say it's exemplary. It shouldn't be. I mean, I think it should it should be standard. But I right. mean, the fact you know, right? No, it is not typical. This is the problem, right? And so I also get hammered, like with Pat. What somebody said, uh, I get hammered daily with people calling me, getting uh, substandard inspections and remediation. And they want me to come out and unravel it all and, and fix it and put it back together and, and, and redo it. It's horrible. Right. So, mm. you know, I'm constantly in this battlefield of, you know, battling people that do, have no business doing this at all. Right. And so um, that's just my two cents. That's right. good. But, but, yeah. but, 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 how, but how do we, how, as an industry, then, you know, I, re I really wish we had another hour. As an industry, how do we combat that? You know, because that's I've been I've been asking that question for thirty some years now. You know, I've been doing this thirty five well, years. Yeah, I mean, I've built my reputation in this St. Louis area, and you know, it's funny because, you know, yeah, it's about money and economics, and and it costs to do everything the right way. You know, and I I educate people on the phone. I'm like, look, this is how you need to do it. This is how you should do it if you want it done right. There's a bunch of other ways to do it. But, you know, and, and it's funny, you know, you, you can have insurance adjusters who don't want to pay for mold inspections for claims, but if they have something that happened in their own house, they call me. They don't want to have it, their insured do it, but that's you know. classic. Right. <laughs> classic. I, you know, So that's the thing. It's like, I, I think you just be a professional, do the right thing, try to make partnerships with reputable remediation contractors in your area. I mean, I literally, there are some projects, like if I do a mold inspection and report and there's a protocol and the customer calls me back, say a month later, says, okay, come out, it's ready for clearance. And I'd never heard from anyone and I didn't know it started and I know who it is and I ask him who did it and I find out it's some no name or somebody, I have no idea who it is. And, you know, I'm not, I, I call the person and I ask him a couple of questions. First answer he gives me, I'm like, nope. I'm like, I'm not coming. I'm not coming back. I can't come back and well, reinspect it and do a it's, clearance. Yeah. Well, that happens. It's like New York has licensing. So that happens in New York all the time, right? Yeah. You know, any states with licensing, the licenses don't require that the same, in New York, they're called assessors. The same assessor doesn't have to do the front end and the and the back end post evaluation, which to me is like, I am not going in and assessing somebody else's work when oh. I haven't seen any of the work, never saw it before they touched it. I, I, I I walk away from that every well, I freaking absolutely time. Will not do that, but I it. absolutely will not go back and, and, and reinspect a project that was done by a substandard remediation yeah, yeah. contractor. So, it is a drama cluster and yeah. I'm not getting, I'm not doing it. Right. And it says right on my report, when I give them the report, I'm like, right. you have to do all this. What? No, no, it's just Pat, Pat was, Pat's been trying, very politely oh, raising his finger. Oh, anyway, <laughs> I, I say on my report, when I give it to the client, it says all these steps need to be completed by a reputable credentialed cert certified remediation contractor in order for me to come back and do clearance. It's in the report, you know, and mm -hmm. of course they never read it. And then they call me and then I'm like, I, I can't come back. And then they get mad at me because I'm not coming back. I'm like, I'm not. You're a difficult consultant to work with. I'm just messing <laughs> no. with you. No, you, mean, you're, you're doing really it right. Not, yeah. You know, it's like, no, I, I'm, I think, I, I'm being I, funny. I think the, the key is, is like, it's like communication upfront. What do you expect? What, what, how's it supposed to go? I'm like, you can do whatever you want with your house. I don't care, but I'm not going to come back. Here's what you're supposed to do. And I can't come back and clear it if the steps aren't being done. Right. right? So anyway, that's all I got. Very good, Patsy. That was awesome. Yeah. All right. So it is 154. Um, however you guys want to like work it, let's like, do some final thoughts. Let's wrap this up because Bob had a completely different show planned. So I think this has been great that it's like, um, now it's different. Okay. All right. So final thoughts, Scott, you go first and then we'll go to Pat and then whoever else. You limited final thoughts though. You can't go five minutes each. Oh, Scott. We have to, yeah. we have to establish, we have to establish an industry justification for what we're doing. We use that word all the time. Pat's heard me use it. 
We need to begin to gather our resources together, our strengths together. We have to start to put a stop to the, the mass marketing of sampling. So somehow, you know, the, the, the bulk of people here in this the, the, have to get together and say sampling is not where you start. And if you're going to sample, you better have a reference for it. I, I wanted to ask about the endotoxins, the, the, I mean, the mycotoxins, the surfaces. What reference are you telling people that there's a health problem if you have a condition too, right? I, I want to see the references and the standards that say if you have a condition too, which is an invisible condition, right? Condition three is easy. That's visible mold, visible dirt, dust, and debris. That's not a problem. That's what we all agree on, visible clearance. I want to know if you take a sample, how do you know it's a health problem? It's not an aesthetics problem. It's not a utility problem. Invisible spore. I never saw in condition two ever, you know, jam up the gears of some device or make a computer not work. Never saw it mess up the surface of a sofa or a wall. And I want to know, how do you know it's a health effect? I don't care if it's stachybotrys or cladosporium or alternaria. I want to know how many spores per cubic meter you're allowed before or during a health problem. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is no reference for that. Yeah, there isn't. There. <laughs> Mycotoxins are spores. So why are we taking all these samples? And, and another side to that is person A, person B, person C, you know, you're standing in a room that's got a hundred thousand stackies per cubic meter. Person A might be just perfectly fine. Person B has got the sniffly, sneezy, coffee, achy, stuffy head, fever kind of a thing. And person C might be laying on the floor waiting for an ambulance. Not What's, from the mold. But yeah, but I mean, why? Not from condition is two it, mold. Is it, is it because of the stachybotrys in the air? Is it because they're just super sensitive to, to spores? I mean, there's, there's no way to determine that health aspect <clears throat> by air sampling. It doesn't, it doesn't do it. That's why I only use it for our own in-house use to base ideas and get, or get an idea of what's going on for remediation purposes. And when people call and say, I don't feel good in my house, we have long discussions before any sampling plan is ever put into place. And we start with a, and Bob's going to like this. We start with the multiple mega amounts of samples. And then the price tag usually drives the job right off a cliff and it never happens. So I, I won't do the three sample. I don't feel good in my house thing. Well, you're also clarifying that you're taking environmental samples. You're not taking samples that are in any way, shape or form you can make health claims with because we can't because we don't have that correlation. It doesn't, Scott hit it. We don't have that. Let them How many spores make doctor. somebody sick? I don't know. Let, let them take it to their doctor, the results and all this stuff. Their doctor, doctor doesn't doctor. know either. Right. And then know. let their doctor be the, the supposed person that's the expert in this field. You know, not it ain't me. It's apples to oranges. It's environmental samples to like, you know, blood work. They, they, no, there's no correlation. Their doctors were informed by somebody who never even went to a biology or chemistry class. Come on. Yeah. We know the industry. We know who's informing <laughs> who. Right. But, but let that let that be let them deal with sure. that don't you know just stay sure. the heck out of that part just they want to do that let them do it but don't don't be the guy that makes those decisions that that's my advice to anybody in this thing i'm going to be provocative again <laughs> yes uh, everything you're saying is correct uh, uh and put in the context of the the basic objective and purpose that's to help people's residences or buildings that they're working in um, be healthy so that the people are healthy, right? And the dilemma that we all face is that research is showing that microbiological toxins, I'm not talking about allergenic effects, okay? What concerned me are the toxigenic effects. The research is showing that uh, microbiologicals can have very toxic health effects. They can be cytotoxic, actually kill cells. They can turn off all kinds of genetic uh, genes that affect the signaling between cells and whether a cell uh, does what it's supposed to do, whether the cell can get energy, I mean, generate energy, whether it can get oxygen and nutrients through the cell wall. There's research demonstrating all of that. And we know that people vary in their genetics and therefore what you're susceptible to might be very different than what I'm susceptible to, right? Those are all things that you well-informed um, top-notch professionals that have been speaking, you're aware of all that. 
And so the basic dilemma it creates, it seems to me, is that the standards that exist now in terms of what's acceptable or what's healthy and so forth, I'll overstate it, are irrelevant because what's going to be healthy for a particular person is going to vary. So I think the goal needs to be to create the healthiest possible indoor air environment for people because there's no standard that's going to work for even a majority of people, in my opinion. That's like a completely different show on like what's considered like a top notch IAQ health standard. Scott, you're shaking your head again. Why, why are you shaking your head? I'd like to chime in before Scott comes back in because he's already had a couple okay. of couple turns. Uh, Terry, very well said. I don't know how many of you have been following the litigious cases across the country. In Florida, we just had in early May, a $62 million case that uh, it was a jury case uh, for someone who suffered from severe mold ailments, supposedly. And they had, they had numerous doctors, one from John Hopkins Hospital who testified in her defense. She, and she was from Florida. Uh, and it was the highest case ever. Now I know it's gonna be appealed by the insurance company because 62 million they're not enough to pay out willingly. However, there's starting to be more and more doctors that are taking a stance. And I do think there's, there's times, we do a lot of litigious work and most of ours really is, was the remediation justified? And therefore you need sampling to tell how impregnated the wall cavities were with fungal and water compromise. Uh, but when it comes to exposure samples, we do limited exposure samples, and then we still recommend the results from those to be read by a doctor. And I agree, most doctors don't know. But Terry, I think you're, you're really onto something because the science is starting to come of age. And the only way you're going to find out is to take samples. Scott, if you sit back and you don't take a sample, you're gonna be chewed up in court and they're gonna spit you out, unfortunately. And no offense against you, Scott, because you're an excellent practitioner. I followed you over the years. I, I, I've been in this business since 1972. And I first met Bob back in 1992. And I was at a conference with Bob in 2005. I don't know why his hair never turned gray and mine did. I don't but, die. Actually, the sides are all gray. That's why I wear this crop. <laughs> but when you look at over the years, we're starting to see the science is finally starting to some degree catch up. It's a long ways from being there but we're starting to see a little more uh, of the science. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to get that case, Bob, and send all that information to you. That, that's it, a big and, one. And there was two settlements undisclosed in that with the other two parts. She sued three people, three groups, and there was two undisclosed settlements in that. And then there was the mega million. That was the only one that went to court. So she's rich. And there's a lot that you don't hear about too. Like I was involved with one years back, like late nineties that ended up, settling out of court but i mean it was over a 10 million dollar settlement but it you know it never never hit news or anything it never got out there so there's a lot there's a lot of that behind the scenes too because that's one of the things insurance companies really don't want to have that stuff out public and, and rightly so because you got to also question you know this, I, uh, whatever anyway who, who else needs to go we don't decide science based on court cases, first of we all. We really shouldn't. <laughs> and court cases are rarely, if ever, decided on science. So I just want to point that out. So you cannot use any litigation as an example or justification to take samples. I just, I just want to remind you all of that. If you all recall the Melinda Ballard case, which yeah. I think everyone here does, remember what that was settled on. They never, they chose intentionally to not bring medical witness yeah they didn't dr strauss and them didn't never testified right or, correct. Or, or any of them yeah. because the because the plaintiff's attorney melinda's attorney knew that it would drag it out for another six to ten weeks these are his words and he knew that he had already set he had already won the case 
because the farmers' executives right there's bad faith. They clearly demonstrate the bad faith. Bad yeah. faith. So yeah. every time someone tells me there's a there's a victory, I want to know why, and then I want to know is it actually justified and was it just? And I'm going to guarantee you the dollars don't match. No, I I tell. The other so, thing is the, the the reality is I still don't see the references in the environment. We have a bunch of you know science. But we have no good environmental data. Every time I see a doctor, every time I see one of these groups of doctors or physicians or somebody telling people to go take samples, they do not have environmental data. And Terry is right about we're at we're we're early stages of science, but we cannot relate some laboratory science or some cell biology type science or some 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 immune system science to the environment. There is no connection. There's no correlation. Yeah, you're right. right. It, it's None. not even a correlation. It's not even it's not even association, yeah. except with extreme situations. Right. So go to the cleanliness, the visual clearance. If you didn't have visual clearance, what is left that can possibly cause a problem? That's what I keep asking. I've not heard anybody say on this panel or any other panel. Where's the references when you have visual clearance? Well, what, how do you have? But problem. there's times where you don't have total visual clearance, right, Scott? I mean, like, you know, if you're not doing a total gut of a building, you don't know every wall cavity. There's places you don't you can't do visual clearance if it's not all opened up. So that if doesn't you totally answer. Your, cavity, answer. Then there wasn't a problem in the wall cavity. It's out of the scope of the work. Or they missed it. Who missed it? Well, you maybe as the consultant, maybe, maybe you maybe you missed it, you know, because the you're not paid enough money to, to do invasive ins, uh, inspections of everything. And right. people won't let you tear their buildings apart to, for you to look for things. So go all the way back to the Burge comments, right, that we relied on. What's in a wall and how the hell does it get out? It's just like the subtle dust in a duct. It doesn't uh, It gets out all the time, though. Come on. Pressure differentials. We, we can get into that one. It's you like, you know, the, the building wall dynamics wall? of wind loading and all that stuff. There's, there's, there's stuff moving in and out of wall cavities all the time in buildings. Anyway, you know what? This is great, though, by the way. You know, I, we need more time. <laughs> I, I love listening to everybody, and, and I, all I can do is urge everyone to try to get together, try to find common ground. We have a lot of standards out there right now that are being, uh, you know, written. Consensus is being argued. Um, everybody's got to chip in and, and bring with you references. Show the references. Get the solid science, whether it's Terry or Maurice. Let's see what the hell you're using. Bring it to the committees, right? There's one at ISARC. There is one at ASTM. You know, these are active committees. Bring your stuff. You know, the committees will welcome you as a, as a commenter. You can bring information to the committees if you know how to get to the committee. Bring your stuff and, and explain it. Let the committees hear. I mean, that's something we need. We actually need to get that information more readily discernible that we're, people know how to actually contact committees and get that, you know, because I don't know if that's that's common knowledge on how you would get to one of these committees. Call, you know? call me. <laughs> we'll call you. Yeah, call you. But I mean, you know, I think it's an article, Scott. I think you should write at least a short piece on, you know, how people could get that type of information. That's a good, that's a good idea. It, it really is, you know, because that's, you know, cl clearly an important thing that to have happen. Excellent um, idea. It, I got one piece of advice. If you're going to call Scott, clear your calendar for the rest of the day. So. Well, I mean, I, it's I, always I, very interesting. I've I, never I, had a non-interesting yeah. conversation with you, Scott, ever. Yeah, it, they're long conversations, but they're good conversations. They're But clear your calendar. You're going to need some time. All you have to do is say goodbye and click. It's easy. You could, that's good. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that. slightly a holeish, but yeah, you could do that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, you know, I, I, mean, I, I respect that. I mean, New York, I'm, I'm from New York, so we're allowed to do that. It's almost, it's almost, it's almost part of our demeanor. Uh, I would does be, any, I'd does, be hurt if you didn't just hang up on me. Does, <laughs> does anybody else have a final comment they want to make? Because we're way over time, but you know, I, I don't want to cut anybody off either here. So um, let, let me uh, just jump on a couple of things. One of, one of the places where we could continue discussions like this, oh my, um, is, th so I, I have to announce this again because some of you may not be aware of it. Wow, that didn't go all the way through. Uh, we just last week launched a project we've been working on for a year. It's the Healthy Indoors Online Global Community. And this is actually a platform. Uh, it's a dedicated platform uh, for indoor environmental topics that will allow you to get in there and have these conversations. We can, we, we're going to be live streaming the shows to that. There's discussion boards. It's think of 
uh, LinkedIn and Facebook on steroids specifically for indoor environmental topics. Cause that's pretty much what it is. Uh, and all the discussion boards and, you know, this networking stuff is free. You know, so you can, you can sign up for it for free and utilize that. And then we have some premium stuff. We just, uh, just, uh, the, uh, Asbestos Disease Awareness Organizations uh, National Conference, Annual Conference. We'll be live streaming that on the community. That's a pay-per-view, but it'll be there uh, in September. And we have a few other things that'll be happening there too. So uh, you, you can get to all that. You know, how could, how could you make this happen? Well, if you go to uh, the healthyindoors.com site, and click on community, that will actually take you to a page that will get you uh, down the path of being able to register and you can potentially get a free membership right there. Um, the other thing that we're doing is uh, for the time being, so I'll just let you know, uh, we are offering uh, free pro membership. So the pro membership is gonna allow some discounts on some of the pay-per-view live streaming and that sort of thing, and some premium uh, content that you wouldn't just get in the free membership. Uh, but we're, we're giving those away too at, at this juncture. So that's, uh, so I would definitely uh, check it out because I think, I think it's gonna be an opportunity for people to be able to communicate more. We're, what we're trying to create is a, a hub, right? An information exchange hub between academia, between us and the practitioner end, and really between end users too, to be able to get information and share information. So uh, I welcome you all to get involved in that. Um, not many there because we just opened the door. I mean, I think there's like 40 people on it. Um, well, we just opened it up a few days ago. So we're, we're really uh, excited about how this is going to shape up and you know, open some doors for people. Um, other than that, the other thing I want to announce, um, do I have it where I can get to it? Yeah. Um, I didn't queue up, queue up my graphic here, but I'll, I'll get to it in a sec. So next Tuesday night, um, last month we debuted a new show, uh, and it's the he healthy indoors after hour show. Um, and that's not a great graphic on it. And you're seeing us the live stream there, but the after hour show is a once a month show. It's an evening show. It runs from 7 PM Eastern time to 8 30 PM different format. So picture, I mean, as loose as we were here today, picture looser. So the format is you're at a conference and it's seven o'clock at night and you walk into the lounge and there's other professionals there. And you basically just talk to each other and have conversations. Conversations. So it's relatively unstructured. So next week, we have Dr. David Krauss and Jay West. Jay West as an individual is really interesting. He's come from the uh, from the building performance side. He was involved in that. And uh, recently in the indoor environmental community. And Dr. David Krauss has been a regular on the show, a Legionella expert and really very knowledgeable guy has been in the industry for a good long time. So, um, so I, I invite you to watch that show as well. That show li will live stream to the community. So you could sign up for your community membership and watch it there. We will also be streaming it here on healthyindoors.com. Uh, so you can go to the .com site under the Healthy Indoor Shows and get to it. Um, so that's, there's your options. Um, Susan, uh, are you back in? Are you still here? Uh, I guess we're I guess we're going to be closing it up because we've we've run way over time. Um, I really uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, you know all of your all of your great input here. This is, this has been a great show. Uh, and Susan was right. We didn't actually plan it this way. It was going to go a little bit more structured, but this is fantastic. So thank you all for joining in. Uh, we're going to do more of these because now I can see where this is. This is a form that doesn't exist, correct? You don't have any other place where you can come on and actually talk. There's other shows. I mean, they're usually one directional. Um, that's what, and by the way, that's another plug for the community guys. Uh, that's one of the things we'll be doing is these type of things, meetups, you know, zoom meetings in the community where we, it's just, you know, moderated, but you know, an opportunity for people to meet and talk. So uh, we're really, really excited about uh, just the opportunities to do things like that going forward. So thank you so very much for joining us again this week. Um, so we'll see you next Thursday. Um, same time, same channel, uh, one o'clock to 2 p.m. Eastern time, actually Eastern daylight time now. So uh, until then, uh, I'm your host, Bob Krell, publisher, founder of Healthy Indoors. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Mm -hmm.